dear Heavenly Gracious God, forgive us for each and every known sin that's in our lives. And we thank you for what Jesus Christ did at the cross of Calvary for each one of us. We ask you to make it real today by your Holy Spirit unto the believers of the household of faith as it relates to the devil, Satan, Lucifer. And out of it all, may we understand the spiritual battle that we're facing each and every single day. But also, may we understand that the victory has already been won through Jesus Christ, our Savior. In Jesus' name, we ask you and thank you. Amen. Welcome back to Challenges of Faith radio program. I'm Gary McCance. Thank you for joining. Is Satan really real? There's so much today concerning Satan that when you hear, a lot of times even from some of those behind the pulpit and the pews, It's not even biblical. I believe that Satan is a reality. He's a person. He's an enemy. Satan doesn't want to be identified. Think about your two-leg enemy. You think they're running around, raising their hand, depending, trying to let you know that they're your enemy, that they want to do you harm. Satan doesn't want to be identified. Unawareness or ignorance of his movements and his motives, powerful weapons he's using today. You notice how he moves with subtlety, which characterizes him. And that's the reason why you see him in the Garden of Eden as a serpent, you remember? You'll see him under different disguises as you go through the Word of God. And he does this because he doesn't want his true character to be known. He attempts to hide that from you and you and you and me too and humankind globally. But if you really want to know how successful he's been, look inside your life, your home, your neighborhood, out there in the community, your village, the province, and ask other people for their opinion. Because what you're going to find is probably one out of ten will say that they believe Satan is a reality. And the other nine would think that he's merely a made-up story. So as you can see, he's done an excellent job of making you and you and you, whoever you happen to be, believe he doesn't exist. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, we're not ignorant of his devices. Can we say that today? Because the average person is ignorant of his devices. And I believe even believers of the household of faith, you know, Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, are not really on the alert. John says in Revelation 12, verse 9, that Satan deceives the whole world, emphasis added. He's the one in the business of deception. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, but evil men, women too, and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They're going to deceive others because they themselves are the children of Satan. You say, what? I know you've read the word. You hear people all the time talking about everybody is a child of God. What does that say in the word of God? But if you turn to John chapter 1, verse 12, it tells you how you must become a child of the living God. 
But the children of Satan, they see themselves, they'll be deceived. The world outside, as you know, is carrying on a scam. Look around globally. Look at all these individuals who are <clears throat> taking advantage of other people, seeing who they can deceive. The other person scams. Hacking. <clears throat> Relationships, communications. In all types of ways. Trust. That's the satanic system that exists today. And Paul, writing to the Corinthian believers and speaking of non-believers, said in chapter 4, verse 4, I know you wrote it down, whose minds, you know where the battle takes place? The God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Satan has blinded the minds of multitudes concerning, guess what, the gospel. You notice that's the only subject which will blind the minds of people. Have you noticed that the God of this world, which is another name used for Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they will not believe the glorious gospel of Christ? And actually, as you get in the Word and you look around, the human family is said to be imprisoned by Satan. Here's an example, you know. You have a prison house, and you really, it's invulnerable. You can't get out. And there's no way out except through this door. Lord Jesus said, I'm the door. You see, the only way you can get out is through Christ. And you can't get out any other way. Satan is watching the one place of escape. And that's through the gospel of Christ. And the only thing he's concerned about in your neighborhood, your neighborhood, your village, your province, your city, your county, your state, your nation, and mine, is that people be blinded to the gospel of Christ. And he's doing an excellent job. Last Sunday, 90% 90% of the pulpits, the congregations, was told to do something. And they'll probably be told today in order to get to heaven. Satan likes that because it's his so-called good news. And that's what he told Adam and Eve. He wanted to convince them that by doing what he said, they could become like God. And he's telling people all over this world, don't believe the Bible. You'll be able to make it by your own efforts. You can do this yourself. You'll become as little G gods. Don't take the position that Christ shed his blood in order to redeem you. You don't want this business of the gospel of Christ. There's no other way. Guess what? Jesus Christ is the only way out. And here's where Satan blinds the human family, irrespective of your skin tone, irrespective of where you live at, irrespective of your politics, irrespective of your wealth or lack thereof. I believe that any other person who declares the gospel of Christ is immediately under attack. That person is Satan's enemy. Satan uses every way to blind men's women, women and men's eyes to the gospel because he's a master at this deception today. Look around. Look all the people that's being deceived. And what did our Savior say even by, about those who are believers of the household of faith? And you know why we're <clears throat> looking at Satan? We have to look at the angels. 
And while you're looking at the angels, I know you have your pad ready. And you've looked in the word and you've seen how angels are divided into two classes, those who are obedient to God and those who belong to Satan. You said what? Yeah, just like he has his own children, his own pastors or ministers. And you see the distinction in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, and the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. So here you got good angels and bad angels, God's angels and Satan's angels. And as we see, Michael, who is called the archangel over in Jude, verse 9. And I believe there are other archangels, but as far as you can see, the holy angels are under Michael. And you notice in Revelation 12 that Michael and his angels fought. He's opposed to Satan. And evidently Satan was an archangel, and when he rebelled against God, some unholy angels went with them, and some of them are already reserving chains for judgment. And the angels who didn't keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he had reserved an everlasting chains into, under darkness for the judgment of the great day in Jude, verse 6. <clears throat> and others of them are called demons, which do Satan's business. And those have yet been <clears throat> to be brought to judgment. And the question is, why God has made that distinction? I don't know. And I know there are those of you sitting somewhere, you know, but I don't know. There are degrees of responsibility even among angels. And the responsibility is what made it impossible for some to have an outlet at all because they are reserved in chains. And when you come to the person of Satan, there are at least... 40 names given to him in Scripture. For example, you have four names in this one verse in Revelation, chapter 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that that servant of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels was cast out with him. You notice that he's called the old serpent. Do you notice that? And here in the last book of the Bible, it takes us back to Satan's first contact with humans in the Garden of Eden. He appeared there as the shining one. So he's called the old serpent. He's also called the devil, which is the Greek word diabolos, meaning <clears throat> slanderer or accuser. Anybody with two legs? running around doing that today. But you also got to keep in mind because it has something to do with his present and future work. He's also called Satan, which means adversary. He's the adversary of God. He's the adversary of all God's children. And that's why you hear me say, as I grab a sip of more water, because I can't get to my tea. That's why you hear me say there's a lot of believers of the household of faith who don't understand that they have an enemy, a spiritual enemy. But we're told in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And even there you see three titles given to him. Satan is called the accuser of our brethren in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. He's called Apollyon in Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, which means destroyer. He's called Belial in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, meaning worthless or lawless. And he's called the evil one. You remember that when our Lord taught his disciples to pray? He included, deliver us from the evil one, which should serve as a warning, believer of the house of the faith. And then again, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, when he prayed the real Lord's Prayer, that is, his own petition to the Father, said in John chapter 17, verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, 
but that you should keep them from the evil one. Think about that. Ponder that. Pray about it. Meditate, not transcendent. You're on your knees praying about <clears throat> that God would keep you from that evil man, that evil woman, that evil woman, that evil man. Did you think about the devil too and the demonic forces? Because Satan is also called Beelzebub in Mark chapter 3, verse 22, where the scribes accuse Christ of casting out demons by Beelzebub, the prince or ruler of the demons. And those are just some of the names and titles of Satan. And do you notice that Satan has a distinction of being the originator and promoter of evil? Did you know that? <clears throat> but what you have, you have a lot of people, a lot of movies over the years, and maybe today, inaccurately ascribing physical forms to Satan. And what you see <clears throat> today, for example, the Satan as a creature with horns, a forked tail, a cloven feet, which comes from the literature of the Middle Ages. That's what you normally see today about Satan. And when you do your research, you'll see that its origin is Greek mythology. And it's a description of the God, little G God Pan, or Bacchus, the God of pleasure. And all of this, when you put it all together, has shaped the thinking of Christendom concerning Satan more than the Bible has. Now, you know it's time to go back to the Word of God and see what God really has to say about him. And when you do, you see how Satan is a personality. Remember that our Lord addressing the scribes and Pharisees said, you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. John chapter 8, verse 44. You see how this is the way scripture speaks of Satan? Did you notice that our Lord refers to him definitely as a person, a liar? And a murderer, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Repeat it again, First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. You know, <clears throat> someone has said about Satan that he's to be dreaded as a lion, he's more to be dreaded as a serpent, and he's most to be dreaded as an angel. Because we think of him as being a frightful, scary being, but he was not created that way. You say what? In Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, I know you wrote it down. It lets us know that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. And if you could see him, you'd agree that he's the most beautiful creature you've ever seen. And one of the reasons sin is attractive is because Satan is attractive. He's concerned about the things of culture and refinement because he's in the middle of those things that are considered the best things in life. Look around globally in your country, your country, your country, and mine. But when you go back to the Old Testament, you see the origin of this evil one. The passage that deals with this is Ezekiel chapter 28. I know you wrote it down. When you start with verse 11, we see Satan behind the king of Tyre, and Tyre was a great commercial center. It represented the final Babylon, which God will destroy because it's satanic. But do you notice, <clears throat> moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up lamentations for the king of Tyre and say to him, the things that follow could never apply to a human king of Tyre, but they do apply to the ones behind him. And the reason why it does is because this angel is the highest creature God has ever created. Oh, you thought you was? You notice what God himself says about Satan in verse 12? Thus saith the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, 
and perfect in beauty. Do you notice that Satan was the wisest creature God ever created? No angel, no other being was ever created with the intelligence that God gave to this one. He was the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And when God says perfect in beauty, I can't even imagine what would that be. I know you walk around, and yes, your husband, your boyfriend, your wife, your girlfriend, or whoever comes to your heart and mind, daughter, moms, cousins, aunts, uncles, you name them. They're handsome. They're beautiful. But do you, you remember, did you hear what God said about Satan? Still a perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. And when God says perfect in beauty again, I can't even imagine what that would be. You're talking about a creature today, the highest being this side of God, and thank God he is not God because only a creature, because it would be frightening, scary, if he were anything but a creature. And what type of power do you have, you have, you have, and me too? On our own, without Christ, without the Holy Spirit of God to help, without the Heavenly Father's help. But wait a minute now. As creature, compared to you and I, again, we're no match for him at all. You and I can't fight him. The Word tells us to resist him. In Ephesians chapter 6, we're told to put on the whole armor of God and to stand. We're never told to fight. We're never told to fight because he can overcome you and me, me and you at any moment he wanted to. And were it not for the grace of God, we would be destroyed by him. He has more to do with your life, your life, your life than you think he does. He has a lot to do with the lives of believers because he hates believers of the household of faith. But there are a lot of believers running around here who don't understand, don't know that. Do you notice what's said concerning Satan in Ezekiel chapter 28? We never left it. You were in Eden, the garden of God. This is not the garden of Eden that Adam and Eve were in. Although, you know, Satan had also been there too. But this is a different kind of Eden. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. And these jewels are only found in two other places. They're in the garments of the high priest and his breastplate that you can see in Exodus chapter 28, verse 15 to 20. And you'll find them garnishing the foundations of the walls in the New Jerusalem. And you can find that in Revelation chapter 21, verse 18 through 21. But here in Ezekiel, we see this creature covered with all these precious stones representing that which is highest and heavenly. And that right there will give you some type of concept of his beauty. And do you notice the workmanship of his timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day you were created? Verse 13. Do you notice he was created as an instrument of music? He didn't carry around a musical instrument. He was a musical instrument. And maybe like a mighty pipe of organ. Now, can you imagine that kind of music compared with some of what you're listening to today that's classified as music? Can you imagine the effect that this creature would have upon all of God's intelligences? He's a walking sympathy, and he's imperfect in wisdom and perfect in beauty. And that's not all. When you look at verse 14, you were the anointed cherub. We're not talking about a man. The word cherub is a singular of cherubim. Cherubim are symbolic of God's holy presence and unapproachable majesty. They're celestial beings who guard and vindicate the righteousness of God as I reach for my water and slow down. Satan was one of the cherubims. 
Now, <clears throat> whether there were others equal to him, I don't know. I know that there's somebody listening that knows, but I don't know. Because I assumed that all the cherubim was on the same level. But this one, you were the anointed cherub who covers, holds a unique position. The anointed cherub who covers is a picture in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve had been sent out of the garden and God placed the cherubim to guard the way to the tree of life. And they were protecting the way of life so that man could come to God so he would not be destroyed by the holiness of God nor be judged by God. And further on in history, when you continue reading, you see how that when Moses made the mercy seat and placed it at the tabernacle's holy of holies, God's glory dwelt between the cherubim. And the cherubim covered it. You can look at that over in Exodus chapter 25, verse 20. Satan was a cherub. And his position was to guard the very throne of God in heaven. And he looked down upon it as though those cherubims looked up down upon the mercy seat in the tabernacle. His position was that of protecting the holiness of God. <clears throat> and Satan had occupied this position. Guess what? The highest of all positions. And you're walking around, running around, saying, what about the devil, Satan, when the word is letting us know <clears throat> you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stone. This is an Eden, not of green grass and trees and animals, but of stones, beautiful stones. And you notice this interesting verse in verse 15. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Imagine, <clears throat> go ahead and ponder it now. This highest of God's creatures, perfect in wisdom, beautiful beyond description. <clears throat> There's no way in the world for you and I today as human beings to conceive of the beauty of this creature given this high exalted position and a musician too. But this creature <clears throat> with all of these attributes also had a free will. God had created him as he did the angels with a free will. And this created intelligence to make a choice. And one day God said to say iniquity was found in you. What did he do? You know how you run around <clears throat> when somebody, you hear rumor, gossip, has done something you can't find out. You go to people, what did he do? What did she do? What did she do? What did he do? What kind of iniquity could be found in him? Was it getting drunk, intoxicated, taking drugs? What was this covering chair doing? Well, in the book of Ezekiel, <clears throat> Ezekiel, God has let us stand with him at the very beginning to see the origin, the creation of Satan. But in the book of Isaiah, God lets us see his character. Now look at it. What was his sin when iniquity was found in him? He had to do something really bad. I mean, did he kill somebody? No, he's not guilty of none of those things. Say what? Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. He's an angel of light. <clears throat> he's Lucifer. And when the sons of God shouted for joy at the creation, Satan was there to shout for joy also. He was a liar from the beginning. Oh, oh, wait a minute now. The same thing that's in the human heart. Your heart, my heart, and whoever comes to your heart and mine. Notice 
Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nation. Wait a minute now. Say what? How many ever countries are on planet Earth, whether those still in existence change names to the names today, made up of people that are comprised of as a nation? <clears throat> the Word of God says he weakens the nation, and he's weakened us today. Here in the United States, we're weakened. But let's find out what his iniquity was. Do you notice his five I wills? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. I will go down to hell. What? What? Is that what he said? That's not the direction he wants to go. That's why it's important for you to read the total verses, the total, because somebody can insert something that's not there or say something that's not there. If you think he's interested in hell, you're wrong. He hasn't been there yet, and he doesn't want to go there. He will resist until the end. What he actually said was, I will ascend into heaven. He's interested in that direction. Listen to his second I will. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'm going to take over. After all, he's perfect in wisdom and beauty. He has a lot of followers that Satan has stirred of discontent. Remember among the angels? Yeah, could you imagine how he approached them like that man, that woman, that woman, that man that approaches you, irrespective of the title, the zip code, what they have and what they don't have, their outward appearance, you name it. Titles, materialism, love of money. But could you imagine how he approached them? Hey, how do you feel about the things that's being ran around here? Are you really satisfied with your job? Wouldn't you like to have a higher position? I mean, don't you think you're being a little excluded? You hear that today? Do you? Well, that's the tactic of Satan. You notice that's what he used with Adam and Eve as well. That's what human beings do. And they do it right in the place of worship. Anyone on a church staff can tell you that. Sometimes somebody will take a member of the church staff out to lunch or dinner or whatever, and in the course of the conversation, ask, how do you feel about the pastor? And what they're doing is seeing if they can run a wedge between the pastor and the church staff. You know, Satan is clever. He goes into the churches every Sunday, and he majors in sowing discord. And he can cause you to feel neglected and unappreciated. Oh, how subtle he is and how satanic it is. It's a lie that began in heaven among the angels. Wouldn't you like to have a better position? I'm thinking about setting up a little kingdom of my own. I've got you in mind for a higher ranking position. You heard that before? Here you, here you got Satan talking to the other angels. God hasn't given you a chance here that he should have given you. You were created for something better, yet he's not going to give it to you. And I don't know why he doesn't, but I'll give it to you. I'm making plans to lead a rebellion. Will you come with me? You see how subtle it is? And guess what? And you think you got it going on? Some of the angels fell for it. How could an intelligent angel fall for that? I know intelligent human beings today who fall for the same thing, is satanic. And it's inside the place of worship. And you think the devil's at work when people go into sin, become intoxicated or steal something? No. They sit in the pew as pious as you please, and they sow seeds of rebellion. That's satanic. 
And that's the way he moves. And you're no better than they are if you listen to them. Because the angels who listened to Satan went with him. Think about that person that's real in your life. That's upbuilded you, never taken away from you. And you got people around you for whatever their true motives are. They're whispering things in your ear, saying this, saying that. And your eyes are not open. Your spiritual eyes are not open. You know, relationship, trust. And you fall for and you believe them until it's too late. In the book of Revelation, we see that Satan took a third of the angels with him when he rebelled. Think of that. A lot of them felt that they could get by with it. And you may think that Satan's tactics don't work, but they worked in the Garden of Eden. And you don't think they work today? Go go to whoever you think is intelligent. That lady, that lady, that guy, that guy, that lady, that man, that woman, that woman, that man. You know, the ones with the high IQs. And they'll tell you that they're smart, smart enough to get what they want by themselves. Okay. That they don't need God. Okay. Well, it's the lie of Satan today that you can work out your own salvation, that you're smarter than anybody else. <clears throat> All of us want a status symbol of some type, and we all like to feel they're really, that we're really somebody. But when God saves you, guess what? He takes you as a nobody, and that's the reason he's not popular today. And it's God's way. Notice again the I wills of Satan. Remember, it's subtle. It's satanic. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. What? The devil didn't want to be the devil. He wanted to be God. I will be like the most high. But a lot of people think that the devil wants to be the devil. He doesn't. That's why he led a rebellion against God. And that's the thing he told Adam and Eve. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. There are a lot of people running around today who believe that they are good enough for God's heaven, really. Well, that's Satan's lie. You have no idea what the holiness of God is. And in the final analysis, what is sin? Because we've seen the interest of sin through Satan. Remember, he was setting his will against the will of God, are you? Remember now, anything that's contrary to the will and character of God is sin, murder is sin, not just because God says it is, but because it's contrary to the will and character of God. And what's interesting, as we continue to talk about Satan and his character, remember, you're running around, you know you are, Come oh, this is the worst sin on the planet, this is the worst sin. Where, where's that it in the Word of God? Because what we're really talking about is pride. Oh, oh, wait a minute! You didn't think pride was a sin? Well, let's continue. Satan said, "In substance, I'm not interested in this job of being the covering cherub." I know I'm the highest creature, but after all, I think I'm pretty enough and I'm wise enough and I'm smart enough and I'm good enough to be God. And I want to be God. That's what he said to the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4, verse 9. If you fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Look at all these people running around today. Acting like they're little G-God trying to create this, create that, create this, create that, clone this, clone that. That's what Satan was after. And that's what so many people are after today. Positions, power, prestige, status, materialism, all those things temporarily. You're talking about things of the world system. Could you imagine little old man, little old woman, little old woman, little old man who says to God, I won't do what you want me to do. I'm going to do it my way. But that's exactly what men and women, women and men are saying today. You're not going to do the things your way because God's will is going to prevail in the final analysis. 
And so, therefore, the prayer of all God's people should be, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, like Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 talks about. But you've got to remember now, anything that's contrary to his will is sin, irrespective of what it is. You remember how the word lets it be known there's a way that seems right to a man, woman too. But this end is the way of death, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. And so here you have humans, irrespective of your skin tone, setting your will against the will of God. But the will of God is coming through this world and through his universe like a steamroller any creature, that means you too, that gets in the way of the will of God is going to be crushed because God's will must prevail and anything contrary to that is sin. So the sin of Satan was that he set his will against the will of God. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Look around today. Everybody wants to do their own thing, make up their own rules. Remember how the word lets us know that one day wrong was going to be right and right was going to be considered wrong? That's what sin is, basically. It your way, you know it's true. And that's all that a human being wants, their way. But you got to remember, you and I are sinners as long as we put our will against the will of God. The next time, we're going to talk about the road that Satan is playing here on earth, the cosmos, where he does have charge. He is responsible for causing all this havoc here on earth with all these nations. Remember now, comprised of humans, 